So um, we'll finish cereal proteins today and we'll hopefully start egg proteins. I'm not sure if we'll get done with egg proteins. So for your exam two, it will be till the end of cereal proteins. So you'll have enzymes, milk, legumes, cereal proteins. So four topics. And then for the final, then you'll have the new material would be egg proteins and protein modification. And then everything else from the beginning. All right, so we did some introductory slides in, uh, for cereals. Any questions from past material? Any clarification? So the albumins are usually have a specific function. So they're either enzymes or enzyme inhibitors. So they are, their, their make is not really, and monomeric mostly. So, yeah. No, so you, 7S and 11S usually, um, so the 7S is your beta conglycinin and 11S is your glycinin. So you can go from beta conglycinin to glycinin, no. But for example, 7S and 11S can become 15S if they associate with smaller uh, subunits that dissociated from other components. Okay. So yeah, you cannot convert one to another. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. You're, you are very responsible. Okay, any other clarification or question? Uh, yeah? Um, do we need to know like, all the types of the, the mutation of our RNA? Okay, so here's the thing. Understanding how it is derived is, helps you understand the equation itself, but I'm never, ever going to ask you in an exam to derive it. Did I? Did I ask this? I can't remember that. If I did, I probably was a very mean person. <laughs> and gradually, I'm becoming a better person. But um, no, I would never ask you to derive it from the beginning. But I expect you to know how it came about, because it helps you with understanding certain rules that, is, that are related to the equation. OK. Any other uh, questions related how to the exam, to study for exam or anything? The general concept and the concept that uh, is, is related to the class material and how the presentation, um, like an example to the it's an applied example to what we studied. So I might ask you any question, give me an applied example, then you can take that from a presentation. Yeah. Say, start from the beginning, sorry. From so for Do you mean the higher salt concentration? Yeah, I mean the higher salt concentration. So when you have higher salt concentration, acidic groups will be mostly exposed versus the basic groups. And the basic groups are mostly hydrophobic, more hydrophobic than the acidic groups. OK, good questions. Yeah? Yeah? What's the color? Well, well, the milk protein, you have casein proteins. They, uh, um, they project light, so they're giving you the white color, whereas whey protein don't have that. Oh, yeah, so they're colorless. Was this one of the questions? Yeah. Oh, and actually, my son got that right. 
Well, not just whey protein. Any protein can induce browning in the presence of sugar. Yeah, but that wasn't what I was gonna. I was asking for, but it's not not completely incorrect. You have some some correctness in your answer. See, I'm becoming a better person. I told you so. Yeah, good. Any other clarification? All right, good. If you think of more, we can um, have other questions at the end of the lecture if you want. Okay, so um, looking at the protein components of cereal, um, well, in this case, wheat, they're known to be proline-based uh, or class proteins that predominate the wheat. So if we look backwards here a little bit, um, so there is the prolamin, the subfamily for wheat, and for wheat, it is really gliadins and glutenins, but glutenins are the class of glutelin. So according to Osborne fractionation, you have the albumin and globulins will be soluble, albumins in water, globulin in salt, and then you have the prolamines will be soluble in 70% alcohol, and then the glutelins are soluble in acid, um, and you require some additional solubilization, either detergent or you would, we usually add beta mercaptoethanol because these are larger and they're polymeric, whereas gliadin is, for example, mostly monomeric proteins. So although you will see in references, people refer to both of them as prolamin subfamily, but actually glutenin and prolamin-like and they are mostly known as glutelin class. So I just want to uh, clarify that because depending on what you're reading, you might get confused at the terminology. So the prolamin-based proteins predominate in wheat. So if you run an SDS gel, you'll see that the glidins are more intense than glutenins. So and glidins are your classical prolamins in wheat. Uh, tricetins, I think you have a mis misspelling in your slide. I corrected that. So this is a globular protein, and it's a minor, or um, not globular, I want to say uh, globulin. And it's a minor constituent. So th this class, the prolamin and the prolamin-like proteins in wheat, are very distinctive proteins. You won't find them in any other cereal given their viscoelastic uh, property. So it's really a challenge to make bread, for instance, from other cereals because of the fact that they lack um, the prolamin-like proteins and the prolamin class, or they are deficient in high molecular weight prolamin-like proteins. So, so the prolamin proteins and prolamin-like proteins are commonly known as storage proteins. So they're referred to as storage because they provide the nutrition to, to the germ. Um, so they provide the amino acid nutrition for the germ, so they're called storage protein. But they are the, your functional proteins, basically. And they are responsible for the viscoelastic properties. And this is not a surprise. You all know the different products that they are used in. So wheat is classified usually on the hardness of the grain. So you have the common hard wheat, which is also referred to as bread wheat. This is an average value. The value can range. Um, between 11 to 15 percent, but this is your average value for protein. Durum wheat, which is higher in protein, again, this can go up to 16 percent protein. And usually this high protein, and it's also hard uh, wheat, this makes it um, usable for pasta rather than bread. Making, and then you have the soft wheat, which is low in protein, it's about 8 to 11 percent, mostly on average 9 to 10 percent protein. Um, and then this, this usually is 
used for products that do not require rising properties because the protein in it is not just of lower quantity but it also has different distribution of your glidins and glutenins. We'll talk about the ratio of glidins to glutenin and how they impact functionality later. That yes, they could be similar, but uh, I believe in Durham you have more of the gluten in to glide and ratio is higher. Yeah, um, you need for bread, you need more of the viscoelastic property, you need the viscosity and you need the elasticity. If you really have a very elastic protein, you won't, it might be really good for pasta, but it won't be good for. Uh, the, the, the extensibility needed as well for bread making. Okay, and then uh, this is something that um, I recently started working on, is looking at what causes the hardness in wheat. And it's a group of proteins that are known to be, well, this is the friablin, I don't know if I pronounce it correct, but these are two types of proteins, perindolin A and perindolin B. So they're not present in high concentration in wheat, but if they are present, they kind of um, associate with the starch and imparts some sort of softness to the grain. Now, they're named perindolin because puros in Greek means Puros in Greek. Does anybody know what that means? Wheat. No? Nobody knew that? Okay. So, and then indolins, because they're high in tryptophan. Oh, sorry, and high in tyrosine. Not tryptophan. Uh, high in tyrosine, and the indole group is uh, a group present in tyrosine. So the distribution of the protein in the grain, so you have about 20% of the total protein present in the bran. And in the bran, 15% of the bran is protein. The germ, close to one-fourth of the germ is protein, and this contributes to about 8% of the total protein. So the majority of the protein is in your endosperm, so about more than two-thirds of that. And then um, endosperm is about 10% protein. It's mostly starch. So again, what I said about the osperm fractionation. So here are the proteins in your wheat. So you have albumins are water-soluble, globulins are salt-soluble. And then you have your prolamin and prolamin-like. Prolamin-like is your glutelin. And prolamin is soluble in 70% ethanol. And then your glutelin, you solubilize either in acid or alkaline. And you usually add additional solubilizing agents, so either a detergent or urea. But for us, for example, in the lab, we add beta mercaptoethanol. Yeah? So they are prolamin-like because they're also high in pro, uh, proline. So prolamin is derived from being high in proline. But there are some additional distinction is their solubility. And also they are polymeric. Uh, prolamin, like glidins, for example, are monomeric. What's that? What? Yeah, prolamin, like gliadin in wheat, are monomeric. So albumin and globulins, they are cytoplasmic and membrane proteins. They have either hydrolytic uh, or metabolic activities, such as being an enzyme and needed for germination, or they can be enzyme inhibitors. So let's say if you have a trypsin inhibitor, it would be um, it would be globulin or albumin. 
So, and they are located mostly in the brain and the germ, not in the endosperm. Very few or very small percentage you'll find it in the, endo in the endosperm itself. <clears throat> so, so the main function of proteins, as I said, are your glidins and glutenins. They are the gluten-forming proteins. So they are called so storage protein because they're a source of amino acids and nitrogen needed for germination. And the glutenins can be classified as structural proteins because they're polymeric. So they impart structure to the endosperm. <clears throat> so looking into the chemistry of these proteins, so albumins and globulins are high in basic amino acids, and also they are high in cysteine residues. Looking at uh, glidins and glutenins, they have a very high percentage of glutamine, one of the amino acids. And the high percentage of glutamine, on average about 35% of the protein, that will explain why when the gluten forms, a lot of the stabilizing force is hydrogen bonding. So, and given the name, also they're high in proline. They are very low in charged amino acids, so basic and acidic, and that's what makes them really not soluble in water. So, that they have very low charge density. When you don't have lo those uh, arginine, histidine, lysine, glutamic acid, and aspartic acid, then you have low charge density. Relatively low amount of cysteine, however, they are located strategically for this kind of protein at the terminus. So at the C terminus and the N terminus. So the two termini, <coughs> which facilitates polymerization between two different molecules. So although the number is not high, they are present in a very convenient location, accessible, so they can form disulfide linkages. So So wheat gluten-forming proteins, it's important to, to remember that there's no gluten in wheat. There is gluten-forming proteins in wheat. And these gluten-forming proteins are basically your glidins and glutenins. So glidins are subdivided into four different glidins. You have the alpha, beta, and gamma, and then the omega glidins. So they're all monomeric of average molecular weight around 40 kilodelton, and they vary, plus or minus. In alpha, beta, and gamma, you have cysteine, uh, disyst disulfide bonds, but within each molecule. So it's not enter, it's intra. So intra means within the same molecule, you have disulfide linkages. <coughs> the omega lacks cysteine residues. And these monomeric proteins are responsible for the viscosity and extensibility of the dough. Extensibility, you know, elasticity when you deform, it goes back to original. Extensibility, it extends. It just extends. It doesn't necessarily want to go back to its original shape. It does not resist extension. If you have a really elastic uh, rubber band or whatever, it's going to resist it. You're going to require some sort of form to extend it, and then it's quickly going to go back. So let's say you are trying to make pita bread, and you use wheat flour that is high in glutenin and low in gliadins, and it's a very strong wheat type of flour. So, and you're trying to extend this dough, it's going to shrink. No, you keep trying, trying, and it's going to shrink. You don't want that. 
for pita bread. Yeah. So that's why you want a different ratio of gliadin to gluten in for pita bread versus loaf bread. So the glutenins, you have two classes of glutenins. So there are polymeric proteins. So they do form disulfide linkages across different, so intermolecular, that means across different molecules. So they form a polymer. And each monomer is 68 to 88. But once they form a polymer, they're very, very large. So if you want to run them on SDS page, you really have to use a reducing agent. Otherwise, you're not gonna, they're not going to go through. They're really large uh, proteins. So, And they have two subclasses, the high molecular weight and low molecular weight glutenins. And then I'll show you in a gel uh, where they are usually. And they are responsible for elastic properties. And then we, I'm going to explain why they are responsible or how it was determined that they were responsible for elasticity um, or elastic property. Now, the characteristic feature of the glutenin is that it has a repetitive central domain. What does that mean? So if you have your molecule, in the middle of the molecule, you have repetitive sequences. So these are repet that repeat themselves. So these repetitive sequences are usually these uh, three sequences. So P for proline, G for glycine, Q is for your glutamine. Okay, that's why you see a lot of Qs. You remember, you have about 35% glutamine in uh, in these proteins. Um, and then you have the tyrosine. Uh, thionine, serine, but but anyway, so these are repetitive domains within, within the center of the of the molecule, and then and the length varies from 440 to 680 residues, and that's what differentiates high molecular versus low molecular weight, how big or large that repetitive central domain is. What, what is characteristic about it, like I mentioned earlier, that the N and C terminal domains contain most of or all of the cysteine residues. So they are in the terminal ends with only a single cysteine in the, in the repetitive domain. Of specifically high molecular weight with N and subunits. So here, here they are if you run on a gel. So again, this is under reducing conditions. If you don't run it under reducing conditions, all of your high molecular weight and low molecular weight glutenins will not separate. They won't even move down your gel. Glidins, however, they will because they are monomeric proteins. So your high molecular weight, usually you have three distinctive high molecular weight um, subunits, and then you have the omega glide, and it's somewhere here. And then just above 45, around probably 50 or something, is your low molecular weight glutenins. And then here you have a combination of low molecular weight glutenins and alpha, actually beta and gamma glidins. So again, it's very important to know that there is no gluten in wheat. However, when gliadin and glutenins here interact upon kneading the dough, then you form the gluten. So you have the glutenin, which are polymeric proteins. You have the gliadins, monomeric proteins. They interact together upon kneading your flour with water, and then you form the gluten network, which is this. So upon kneading, you are uh, uh, denaturing the protein and also changing it in the presence of moisture at a particular temperature to go above the glass transition. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So it becomes a flexible or um, goes from rigid to rubbery stage. Then um, 
the proteins can polymerize. Um, here is showing that disulfide linkages are occurring, allowing for the formation of the matrix, absorption of water, and formation of pure viscoelastic uh, material. And it's called viscoelastic because it has the viscosity aspect and it has the elasticity aspect. And the balance between viscosity and elasticity gives you the viscoelastic property. So gluten-forming proteins, like I said, are really uh, not soluble at uh, between 6 to 9, given that they don't, have a, don't carry a lot of charge. If we decrease the pH under acidic conditions, they become a little bit more soluble. That's why when extracting glutenins, for example, we have to have some acid there to help with the extraction of glutenin from your flour. Um, also under alkaline condition and particular temperature, you will break the disulfide linkages, also making it a little bit more soluble. So the acidic pH will give you charge. The a high pH will result in breakage of disulfide linkages. That's why when we want to extract these polymeric protein, instead of using, you cannot use acid and base, you neutralize. So you use acid and beta mercaptoethanol. So you get the function of enhancing the charge on the protein and using a reducing agent to break these disulfide linkages. So when you are kneading as well, and you're, you're denaturing the protein and inducing polymerization, given that you will have the high percentage of glutamine, you start forming, or hydrogen bonding will start to form, and mostly take the sheets between the two multiple molecules that form, start forming a beta sheet secondary structure. So it's beta sheet in this case within the different molecules, uh, among the different molecules, not necessarily intra, I mean within one molecule. It's across different molecules. You start forming a beta sheet structure. And that beta sheet structure kind of facilitates disulfide interchange. So it has been kind of widely known that gluten is stabilized only by disulfide linkages. But one of the papers I put up on Moodle for you to read as a supporting evidence, so researchers have found that actually the beta sheet formation by hydrogen bonding actually facilitate disulfide interchange. So that means it stacks the protein in such a manner that allows disulfide linkages to be to occur due to the proximity of the different molecules to form disulfide linkages. So once the structure is formed, you can either find it referred to as gluten macropolymer or gluten network. Um, and of course, it's insoluble and has viscoelastic properties. So later on, a few years back actually, not very long time ago, in 2001 and then also later in 2011, there was another paper to confirm that, is that these scientists found that, okay, hey, it's not only hydrogen bonding and it's not only disulfide linkages, there are another force that takes place in forming the gluten network. And this is the tyrosine cross-linking. So these groups of researchers, I also have that paper up at Moodle, um, so these kind of, uh, these researchers, what they did, they developed uh, a dough with and without oxidizing agents and with and without reducing agents and with and without peroxidases. And then they monitored, um, by MS, they monitored the formation of a dityrosine or multi the tyrosine formation, basically, tyrosine linkage formation. And they used synthesized peptides and to confirm that as well.
So they observed it in a dose system, and they also used a synthesized peptide. So they kind of confirmed that when they used potassium bromate, which is an oxidizing agent, they observed that uh, the disulfide, not disulfide, tyrosine cross-linking was enhanced, while when they used cysteine and glutathione or BHT, re or reducing agent, resulted in reduction or of that cross-linking, or of the di di tyrosine specifically. So, and they also they tested it with and without peroxidases, and they found that some naturally occurring peroxidases in flour and additional peroxidases that they would add to the flour would promote this radical formation or radical-based um, cross-linking. So, a few studies after that kind of took, uh, confirmed this and summarized the different bonding that uh, can happen once you start hydrating your uh, flour, adding moisture that is, the gluten starts picking up, or the gluten forming protein starts picking up moisture, going from uh, glassy state to rubbery state, denaturing, opening up, and um, forming the different bonding and entrapping water. So these are the different bonding. So you have the hydrogen bonding that facilitates disulfide leakages in addition to uh, tyrosine cross-linking. So we talked about last transition and they're all basically, um, and I think you have I gave you the slides that I shouldn't have given you, which has the answer on it. And your next slide. No? No? Yeah? Yeah. I usually don't do that, but it seems like I just posted my version of the... Anyway, so like I said, so glass transition is basically the going from glassy state to rubbery, rubbery state or a flowable state. So in order for the gluten to form, the protein needs to cross that. And in order for the protein to cross that, it needs to reach a glass transition temperature, which is uh, basically it's, it gets lower as you have more moisture. Um, for wheat specifically, at 13% moisture, gluten can be formed at room temperature. So also some people looked at the secondary structure of the proteins, uh, the researchers looked at the secondary structure of the gluten proteins at development time. So dough development time, so once you form the dough and it's good consistency, then that would be the time, the dough development time. If you let it rest, so how long it stays stable before the structure um, degrades or disintegrates. So they found that for the wheat, it remains what makes the structure of the dough stable over time, especially the beta sheet structure that maintains um, the stability of the, of the gluten network. It remains um, stable over time. It, may, it maintains the stability of the gluten over time. So they measured beta sheet and they saw, saw that in wheat, it remains stable. However, I'll tell you in, a, in corn, it's not the case. And I'll show you that example. However, <coughs> oh, not however. So basically, when you start forming your, your dough, you, all of you probably form dough at some point, right? It starts very, very sticky. Why? Why? And then the more you knead it, the less sticky it becomes. is being creative. <laughs> yes, it 
takes time for the protein to hydrate so and traps the water so the more this the more you forming that network the more it's going to hold on to the water and it won't be sticky like water on the surface it will be water integrated in, into your matrix so the more you need then you become you have that nice consistency not sticky but if you add more water to the to your dough then it becomes sticky so that's why you have to be careful in how much water you add so if you're trying to make a dough at home and you don't have a farinograph so what you need to do is add water gradually and until you get to a, the consistency that you're desired so don't put all of the water at once over the you might put, put excess water so art of making a dough okay without the farinograph so you gradually add the water in yeah again over mixing makes the, not just adding more water than needed even if you continue to mix and mix and mix you are probably breaking the uh, breaking the structure and you're letting the water that's been originally entrapped released become sticky again so you don't want to overdo it because now you are releasing the water as been in the gluten matrix and once you release the water then there you go you get the stickiness so usually you want a really nice and strong dough but at the same time you want it to extend so you don't want it to be too elastic you want to be able to form it into the shape of the bread that you're making so you want some extensibility and some resistance to stretching the extensibility gives you the resistance to stretching so that means if you extend and it breaks then you don't have elasticity it's too extensible so you extend it oh yeah it's it's extending but then it breaks right away so you don't have enough strength to hold it together so you want it to be extendable but at the same time you don't want to break it easily uh, so you want that balance and you want it to be extensible and elastic enough to hold gas bubbles that are generated during fermentation and also during baking when your water evaporates okay so this I just took from one of my students Sitra she this is her research actually she was looking at or part of her research she was looking at the extensibility of the dough system she was producing from different um, flowers so what this is is a texture analyzer and it has a particular rig where you put the dough and then that rig pulls it pull the dough and records the force it takes to extend the dough and also you can measure the length of the dough before it breaks so that gives you an idea about extensibility so the length of the dough before it breaks and the force it takes before it breaks as well so gives you an idea about the strength and extensibility of your dough okay let's answer some questions so how would the agents such as reducing agents or agents that promote disulfide linkages in other ways where it's oxidizing agents and thiol blockers affect your dough structure so if you add a reducing agent what do you expect will happen no bread okay what if you have a really strong flour but you don't need that strength that much strength you want a little bit more balance between extensibility and elasticity so you add a reducing agent so depending on your final product so sometimes you want to reduce that strength that elasticity to get to the balance that you need for a particular application so sometimes you do add cysteine for example to reduce 
some of the disulfide linkages. Sometimes you want to strengthen the elasticity or promote elasticity, so that's where you add ascorbic acid to the flower. So ascorbic acid is a reducing agent, remember, but in the presence of water and kneading with oxygen, then it becomes aldehydroascorbic acid and then becomes an oxidizing agent. Thiol blockers, these are chemicals that are not necessarily uh, approved for use here in the U.S., but these can block sulfidyl groups. And if you block the sulfidyl groups, then they won't form disulfide. Again, it's kind of the same effect as the reducing agent. Okay, so other than adding modifiers or um, dough conditioners, Tony, I would like to, to call them, um, different wheat varieties come with different ratios of glidens to glutenin. So if you want to guess, for pita bread, you want higher glidin to glutenin ratio or lower glidin to glutenin ratio? Higher, yeah. Loaf bread, the opposite. But again, you want to always maintain a balance, not too much of one versus the other. Ye well, okay. So the more, visco the more viscous your dough is going to be, the more extensible your dough is going to be. But this, the softer and harder, actually, this is, um, this is research currently going on in my lab. We're looking at if you knock off the gene that makes the hard red wheat soft. So if you knock out the pronindolin gene, then you, you end up with a hard wheat. From soft, you turn it to hard. What happens is the protein content goes up, and gluten into gliadin ratio goes up. Not sure what the link is. We're trying to, we're studying that. Okay. So how would changes in the amount of high sulfur uh, gliadin? So these are the alpha, beta, and gamma. They have sulfur uh, or cysteine. So their presence, you need sulfur for the glidins to interact with glutenins to form disulfide bonds and form the, um, the gluten. So changing the, rate, the amount would affect the final viscoelasticity of the, of the dough. You would think that if you reduce the glidins, then you will have a more elastic, that's true. But if you reduce it to a great extent, you really won't get a, a dough because it, it is a big part of forming a gluten network. Yeah. And this illustrates what the dough looks like. So fractionation and reconstitution experiments. So people have removed uh, Okay, let me tell you. Actually, this was part of my master's thesis. But I didn't work on loaf bread. I worked on pita bread. So took the flour, defatted the flour, formed a dough, washed the starch out, collected the starch, freeze-dried the starch, took the gluten, fractionated the gluten to nine different fractions, collected gliadins and glutenins, reconstituted the flour, put fat back, starch back, the, glu the, gli the gluten proteins in different proportions back, and made a reconstituted flour with different ratios of gliadin to glutenin, and I looked at the baking quality. So in my research, I found I needed higher gliadin to gluten ratio to make a better pita bread. In other people research that were focusing on loaf bread, they determined that they needed higher, lower glidin to gluten ratio to have a good loaf volume. So they concluded that the glutenin is needed for elasticity, while glidin is needed for um, 
extensibility. And not just that, they extracted the gliden and tried to make a dough with only put back the flour and gliden only reconstituted flour with only gliden, and this is what they ended up with. A really not a dough. It's just a very extensible material. And then they reconstituted flour with only gluten in, and this is the kind of dough they've gotten. It's elastic, it's not extending, you can barely do anything with it. And that's the balance, where they actually have a balance of gliden to gluten ratio to get you the viscoelastic dough. So protein quantity, again, this is highlighting in, in wheat, is not the most driving force, is also the composition of the protein within that particular wheat variety or wheat flour. So here's how we usually extract um, wheat gluten. You form the dough, and then after that, you let the dough rest for a little bit because you want you want it to stabilize, you want your gluten structure to stabilize, and then you wash under water and you get your gluten, which is a very gummy uh, elastic substance. Sometimes you cannot do that because if you're working with intermediate wheatgrass flour, this dough is not going to form. Gluten is not going to form. You put it under water and it all, it all disintegrates. It goes down the drain. So what you want to do, you, can, you have another chemical way of extracting your um, proteins, and then this is you use the Osborne fractionation. So you take your flour, defatted, and you, you um, mix with salt and water, and this will remove, you discard the supernatant that has albumin and globulins, and the precipitate, you wash the precipitate, or extract it with 50% isopropanol, and beta mercaptoethanol, and acetic acid, so you're extracting your uh, prolamine and glutalins together. You're solubilizing everything, the glidins and the glutenins centrifuge and you discard the pellet. Here's any starch remaining in your uh, process that would be precipitated and your supernatant is gluten and, and glidens. Sometimes if you want to just take glidens versus gluten and the step is divided in half, you just extract with the isopropanol, then you get the glidens in the isopropanol and your precipitate would be your glutenins. And then you extract with a more propanol, BME, and acetic acid, and then you get your glutenins. It's not isopropanol? Okay. 70% ethanol? Okay. All right. Thank you for that correction. But if you want both of them, this is the combination. If you want one, that would be 70% ethanol. You are correct. And then this. Very true. Thank you. I stand corrected by my student, which is a good thing. OK. <laughs> and then you run it on the gel, and you get your uh, fractions, obvious, uh, the different components of your proteins. So this is just to illustrate that um, higher, well, lower gliden to gluten ratio, you need that for the loaf volume. The loaf volume becomes, or even height, becomes lower when you have higher gliden to gluten ratio. Because you don't have, you have more extensibility rather than elasticity. Whereas for making pita bread, like I said, you wanted to let the dough extend and not um, come, go back to a smaller shape. Do you know why it 
opens up like that when you bake it. So it's flat. You go with a straight dough. Yeah? Makes it open up. What happens at high temperature? Water evaporates. So, and then you bake. You know how? What's the temperature of baking for pita bread? Is about 500 C. Yeah. So you really high temperature, and it really opens up very fast because then you will have a really abrupt evaporation, and then um, it opens up. And it, it starts opening up, it becomes like a balloon, and then it will break at some point, and then it will come back down. It's very nice watching it. We have a saying, um, if you want to express, if a person is a grumpy person, and you want to express how grumpy that person is, you say, that person is so grumpy, he wouldn't even, he or she, wouldn't smile to a loaf of bread coming out of the oven. Yeah, he cannot resist. It was like, oh, wow, this is so beautiful. But the grumpy person will not smile. <laughs> yep. So you can tell I smiled a lot during my master's. I baked a lot of bread. OK, so corn protein. Um, so it is the main protein in corn is your zein, and even alpha zein in particular is the most abundant. It represents about 70% of the total protein. The hydrophobicity of this protein is exceptionally high, and um, mostly the amino acids that are most responsible for hydrophobicity are these listed here, leucine, proline, alanine, and phenylalanine. So it has secondary structure, so it's rich in alpha helix with some beta turn and random coil. So they exist, the protein exists in protein bodies in corn. However, if um, are released from the protein bodies, they can help in um, enhancing some dough characteristics, but not as a standalone in a combination of flour. So looking more into the viscoelasticity of this protein, so and there is another paper that I posted on Moodle that looked at how can we make a viscoelastic dough from corn protein. So they found out, well, OK, maybe we need to prepare the dough under conditions that allows it to uh, go over the glass transition so that we can form this, convert the glassy to flowable protein. So they determined that corn protein, if you mix the dough at 35 degrees C and um, above the glass transition, then you will form a viscoelastic protein. However, the story doesn't end well, however, you form the viscoelastic dough, and then what happens when it when you bake it? It crumbles like that. Why? Because zein or corn protein lacks the high molecular weight prolamine-like proteins. In other words, your glutenin. So, you what happens to the structure? is that you do not get a stable beta sheet secondary structure. It's not maintained, and it collapses when, when it's baked. So they, after these researchers, what they did is, again, they looked at, they used FTIR, and they looked at the beta sheet formation. <clears throat> so they, they found out that at dough development time, when they used when they prepared it above the glass transition temperature at a particular moisture, the dough formed. But however, when they let it sit for 
you know, to let the dough rest before baking, they monitored the secondary structure by FTIR. They found that beta sheet went down compared to the wheat control, and random coil increased. So here they confirmed the importance of beta sheet formation and stability for the resulting um, texture of the bread. So cornbread, you really need to add something to it to make it um, acceptable. So <laughs> you like that? Flatbread. <laughs> so what you can do, you add a hydrocolloid. You add more a gelling uh, agent to help in the strengthening of the gel matrix or the gluten, well, there's no gluten matrix, but anyway, the gel, gel formation so that you can hold some air. So you add this here, the hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose is added here so that you can see that it enhanced the crumb texture, the cell size, the volume, the height, but, well, got improved. So trying to make bread from rice is also a challenge. Now why do people care? Why do we want, we have wheat bread, why do we want rice bread and corn bread and all of that? Gluten free, yeah. Good, you're awake. So rice bread, in order to make a, some sort of an acceptable rice bread, also rice is Rice protein is low in high molecular weight prolamin-like proteins. There's a very low percentage of those. So you, you need those elastic properties, which are not there. So another way of enhancing some polymerization is adding transglutaminase. So the transglutaminase promotes the interaction between uh, glutamine and lysine. So basically, it's the carboxyamide group in glutamine reacting with the amine group of lysine, releasing ammonia, and forming a covalent linkage in the presence of transglutaminase. So we have a lot of uh, glutamine and some, to a certain extent, some lysine. Then you can induce this type of polymerization. I didn't give you a break. You didn't need to ask for one. Take a few minutes break. Yeah, I saw that you sent me an email, but I didn't open it yet. Coming over. Well, it's okay. It's going to be recorded, but it's fine. Very full. <laughs> Seven to seven. That such is my life. Uh, what am I doing? Gmail. So, okay. <laughs> so this, okay, this is just me to remember that I need to buy tickets to go to IFT. But I can meet 
with you at, at 8.30 or 9? Is I've that got a class with a few different kids. Is that the kind of issues? Yeah, yeah learning to text. Or I think they can probably send you a copy tomorrow morning. And then Maybe you can, well tomorrow I'm at Cargo so I don't work here. I mean I don't check. Here for work. So what do I have for prospective students visit? Okay. What else do I have here? Food science. I just have to make sure I have a question mark. Okay, this is work time for me. Can you guys meet at um, 12.30 or 1? I mean, I can, but you should take out your class at 3.30. Till 3? Three. Um, all right, so you come at three. That will reduce the amount of time I have to work on the paper, but that's okay because I need to meet with you so that we can meet again if you need to before here. If we find that you, we need to, um, just to give us time. So three p.m. then. Uh, do you want to say, all right, let me just put it here. Uh, so if you want. Mm. Okay, tell me to your time. Well, and I'll send you an invite so you'll have one. Thank you. Uh, and this is you, right? And then. This is you, right? Okay, so good. Great, thank you. Yep. So one time Noor was going from the living room to her bedroom and I saw her walking. She has her laptop, Apple, her um, iPad Pro, and her iPhone. And she looked at me, what? I'm not spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, just, uh, Sophia, just if you'd send it to me mon Friday morning, then I can look at it before we meet, yeah, just to have an idea. Yeah, okay, thanks. All right, let's get going. Where is my, okay. All right, so 
this is an example of work being done in our lab currently, and this is um, intermediate wheatgrass. It's a grass grain, basically, it'd be very related to wheat, but it doesn't function at wheat as wheat very much. So since it's related to wheat, so we extracted the protein to look at how different or similar it is to wheat, and we found out that it is similar and different. So it is similar, this is wheat, gluten, and this is the gluten extracted from different lines or experimental lines of intermediate wheatgrass. We found that the similarity is that it has quite a bit of gliadin and even more intense still than the regular wheat. And when we looked at the high molecular weight region, it wasn't those that are commonly found in wheat are kind of deficient. So there were some similarity between certain banding, but it's very low in intensity compared to what we have in wheat. So the high molecular weight glutenins seem to be very deficient. And there is a different high molecular weight glutenin that is of a lower molecular weight. So this explained to us why when we mix it, it doesn't form the typical dough that wheat forms. It's very sticky, very extensible. It's a mess, basically, when you form it it's in the same way you form wheat dough. And it is a mess because of the high amount of those extensible protein and the low amount and wider distribution in molecular weight, smaller molecular weights of the what should be glutenins. So people shouldn't get excited though that it is deficient in, in high molecular weight glutenin so it won't cause celiac disease. No, it does. When they ran ELISA, you had a positive value. I think this is, this is a, a faint banding. And then another one here. Compared to sorghum, for example, you don't see that banding here for the positive. So sorghum doesn't have uh, gluten proteins, but whereas to me, wheatgrass confirmed, given, of course, that you have the gliadins. So you cannot use it in a gluten-free application. So it's not similar to wheat, but yet not so different that you can use it for gluten-free applications. So we looked at further into how can we uh, determine why it is different as well in not just the distribution of the proteins, but also we looked at the secondary structure where you can, we did FTIR and you look under amide one peak, which you can deconvolute to give you the different components of secondary structure. We talked about that <coughs> when we talked about structure characterization. And then we ran into wheat wheatgrass and hard at wheat flour, and we looked for differences, and there were many differences. We also looked at it not just in flour, also as a dough. This large peak here is for water, for the OH groups in water. But anyway, also we looked at them, and there were differences um, in the distribution of the secondary structure. So this is a work done um, here. What we did in this work, we looked at, okay, if we have wheat alone, 0% to meet wheatgrass, let's just focus on 0% to meet wheatgrass versus 100% to meet wheatgrass. So this is only wheat, and this is only to meet wheatgrass. So looking at the beta sheet structure in the dough, you have higher structure of beta sheet in the wheat compared intermediate wheatgrass, and then you have more random structure in intermediate wheatgrass compared to wheat. So not only you don't have the high molecular weight glutenins or the deficiency of those, also when you form the dough, you don't have the stabilizing structure or secondary structure that is common in wheat. So this is also taken from Citra's work. We looked at the distribution of the different proteins using size exclusion uh, chromatography. And we fractionated. You got different fractions. And from there, let's look at 
the gliadins versus the high molecular weight polymeric protein, which mainly constitute glutenins. So if you look at wheat, you have a higher high molecular weight polymeric protein ratio compared to gliadin versus the uh, intermediate wheatgrass, you have a much higher ratio of gliadin to glutenin. So here we did the quantitative versus the SDS page. So the SDS page showed us that there are differences, more gliadins than glutenins. Here it's confirmed by quantification that you have lower polymeric protein ratio to the monomeric proteins compared this in the control. And of course, she tested different lines, and it's almost the same. You have more of the gliadins and less of the high molecular weight proteins. So here, we're giving you an example how we use different structure characterization methods to confirm an observation. Okay, we did functionality testing using farinograph. Are you familiar, all of you, with the farinograph? Kind of, sort of. So a farinograph is uh, where you mix your dough at, and you measure water absorption, and at the same time, you monitor the strength of the dough by looking at Brabender units. Brabender farinograph, Brabender units. So usually you monitor, uh, you, you monitor the strength at 500 Brabender units. So if you look at hard red wheat flour, really very strong. It stays for a long time at 500 Brabender units, whereas intermediate wheatgrass, um, it doesn't. So it reaches development time, and then it breaks. So it really forms a sticky mess. And it has um, lower water absorption cannot take that much water, doesn't hold that much water, because it just, there's not enough matrix to hold the water, that's why it gets sticky. Then the water absorption is obviously much lower than what the wheat dough can hold. Um, not, n well, the, there is a difference in protein content of the bulk. The, this flour has higher protein content, but it is higher because of albumin and globulins, not because of polymeric proteins. So it wasn't at 15% protein. This is just giving you a typical uh, bread wheat. What would the absorption be at, a, at that particular protein concentration? So of course, try to bake with it. Wonderful brown bread. Well, brown because you have really very small seed, very high bran uh, to endosperm ratio. So there's a lot of fiber, a lot of bran and germ material. So it is really dark. And not only dark, well, compared to the whole flour, which is dark, it, this is darker because it has higher fiber content. And look at the volume, it's pretty much, or the squish. Uh, so it might not be the greatest for bread application, but you know, you can make cookies out of it, or cake. If you can overcome the color, you can put chocolate there, and you can, don't worry about color, and maybe a lot of fat and sugar, then you don't worry about the taste. Just to be fair, Tonya developed a new um, recipe of cookies. These are very old recipe of cookies. And to be honest, when I tasted this, I was like, what? It's like guinea pig chow. You know, like you're eating grass, basically. Yeah, but then Tonya got offended. So she really worked on the recipe. <laughs> And she did come up with a really cool, very well tasting. But she did that with refined. Uh, she did the cookies with the refined flour. So we were able to separate the fiber or the bran from these flours. And then she made nice cookies, finally, with that. OK. 
Any questions about cereal proteins? <coughs> Are you sure you don't have any, any questions? I'm really hesitant to start the egg proteins, but I have to. Why am I hesitant to start egg proteins? Can you guess? I love eggs, but I don't like egg proteins. <laughs> No, no sir, I have nothing against egg proteins, but egg proteins is the only protein ingredient that I didn't personally work with. So I don't have that many examples to give you, not as rich as the other proteins, but don't ask me questions. <laughs> egg proteins or egg grams? What does? Oh. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> All right. I will start with this egg proteins business. Uh, okay. What are they used for? What did you say? Okay. What did you say? Yeah. Yeah. So they are used for all of the above. Um, what, why gelation is important? So if you look, um, take an egg, not egg, cake recipe, the, or the, what do you call that, sponge cake? You have a lot of egg, very little pr uh, flour, right? Yeah, is there flour? Maybe a little bit. So what's giving, giving you that texture and the capability to hold the gas is the gelation of the, of the egg protein. Yes, yeah, so in custard, it, yes, anything that requires to have a certain structure um, texture structure, it's because of using the eggs, it's because of its gelation. Now, obviously, it's important for emulsification. So, when you have a product that's rich in cream, like cream souffle, or was it, was it, that what it's called? Cream souffle? Souffle? There, there is another thing with cream. What was it? Huh? I don't know. But it, th those bakery products or items or sweets that require egg. And have, are high in fat, so the, the egg is the egg proteins are foaming as emulsifier. Foaming. So if I say whey protein is the uh, golden, uh, what, what do I call it? The golden child for beverages. Egg protein is the king of foaming. Yeah. So. Yep. Golden standard is the word that I was looking for. <laughs> I was like golden, golden child, yeah. But golden star standard way is for beverages. Egg is for foam. Okay. Oh, there they are. Okay. A and B. Sausages and eggs. Sausages and eggs next to it will be great. Okay. Um, what? Oh. <laughs> Do they? <laughs> oh my gosh. I remember that song. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good thing I didn't say here. <laughs> what 
Well, Sita today in the defense did not pronounce Ash correct. <laughs> and Tonya just laughed. <laughs> Don't tell Sutra I said that. <laughs> she won't listen to the lectures. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> A and B. Okay, so you're all familiar with the egg and how it looks like. Um, so this is just the composition and the distribution. Um, the egg white usually commonly is referred to as albumin, just egg white, albumin. So if you hear that term, with an E here, that is just the egg white. And then you have your, the yolk, and then this whole egg. If we look at comparison, so um, the album is mostly water, versus yolk, you have high uh, solid content. And of course, the lipid, the egg yolk, is your lipid-rich component. It does still have proteins, so um, it's rich in fat and protein, whereas albumin is mostly, the solids in it is mostly protein. So the albumin in egg, when you break an egg, you can, if it's very fresh egg, you can actually see compartments of the egg white. So you have different compartments or, uh, yeah, layers. So you have a, a thin outer layer, you have a thick, firm middle layer, and then an inner thin layer, and then uh, kind of a layer very small, very thin surrounding the egg yolk. Each of these layers differ in composition of the different proteins. So in egg, there are multiple proteins. In egg um, white or albumin, there's a whole list of protein, and they differ in their location in the egg white. Um, guess that's basically what I wanted to say here. So the egg white is main functionality is forming and gelation. As, however, the egg yolk main uh, functionality would be emulsification. Why? Because it is actually, did you know that the egg yolk is actually an emulsion? It is an emulsion. So you have some moisture, you have protein, you have a lipid. It is an emulsion by itself, and that's why it is a great emulsifier because the fact that it's an emulsion, it's high in phospholipids, it's high in lipoproteins, phospholiproteins, so it's an excellent uh, emulsifier. Okay, so albumin, like I said, you have an array of different uh, egg white proteins, and they vary in characteristics. So the ovalbumin is the major component because it represents over 54% of the total protein on dry bases. Well, you have so many different components, but here are just the main ones. So you have up to 19 different components and proteins. So this is a table summarizing the different components. So ovalbumin is the main one followed by conalbumin, of a mucoid, of a mucin, lysozyme, it's spelled wrong here in this table. And then actually lysozyme is a globulin, of a globulin. G1 is your lysozyme. And then G2 and G3 are these globulin 1, globulin 2, 3, 2 and 3. And then evidin, which is a protein that binds what? College board course. Okay. So if we look at this table, it's not only listing them in uh, their uh, abundance, but also you look at uh, the isoelectric point. The most noticeable is lysozyme, for example, and evidin. They're basic proteins. That means their isoelectric point is high, so they're usually at pH 7. They are positively charged compared to the rest that are negatively charged at pH 7. So this is important for when, example for forming the foam. They will interact via electrostatic interaction with the negatively charged protein allowing for the thickness of the film or the matrix of the film to form. Or contributing, not, they are not the only allowing factors, they're contributing to that. 
Also, they vary in molecular weight, but look at ovomucin, for example. It is the largest protein, very, very large protein, because it is very high in disulfide linkages. It forms really a big protein, and also it is, there is no denaturation temperature for that protein. I think <laughs> it is not established, given how uh, the high amount of sulfur disulfide bond and the large uh, protein makes it resist denaturation. So conalbumin, for example, it has the lowest denaturation temperature, but if conalbumin is, uh, in, if there's iron or copper, for example, it will bind strongly with conalbumin and it become, the denaturation temperature becomes high because it will bind in such a way inside of the molecule of the protein, preventing it from opening up. So although the denaturation temperature is low here, in the presence of iron or copper, it will um, delay the denaturation. So differentiating the different proteins now, um, so like I said, ov uh, ovalbumin is the main component of egg proteins, egg white, that is. It is a mono, it's a monomeric protein, and it is a phosphoglycoprotein. That means it's a protein that has uh, phosphate groups and has also a um, carbohydrate group. And then there are three different fractions identified, and they are different by the number of phosphate groups that they have. And their ratio, this would be their ratio in the, in the egg white. So it's a large, relatively large uh, molecule, 385, but it's a very hydrophobic protein. So I just, not only the avalbumin is very hydrophobic protein, other egg white proteins are also hydrophobic or high in hydrophobicity. That's why, and high in sulfur, so high in um, disulfide. So that's why when you cook an egg, your egg white forms a gel, it's irreversible. So once a gel is formed from egg white, it is irreversible because of the high level of hydrophobicity as well as the high amount of cysteine uh, groups. And especially ovalbumin is very important for gelation because ovalbumin has free, free sulfide groups, four free sulfide groups. Other, um, other proteins in egg white, they have high number of disulfide bond, but they don't have the free sulfide group. So when you don't have free sulfide groups, you don't have what promotes polymerization via disulfide linkages. Because these four, these sulfide groups will reduce other disulfide linkages, break, and that's why they call them disulfide interchange. If you don't have a sulfide, free sulfide group, you won't have a disulfide interchange between this molecule and another molecule. So this is very important for gelation because of its unique free sulfide groups that it has. <coughs> so I don't necessarily expect you to memorize this. This is FYI, how much percentage of carbohydrate, but it is low compared to other protein that I'll point out. Um, I already said that point of the free sulfide groups. And what's unique about uh, ovalbumin is with age, it becomes S-ovalbumin. Why? Because as the protein ages, you know, you have these free sulfide groups. As it ages, it starts forming with, within itself and other proteins, other molecules of ovalbumin molecules start forming disulfide linkages, so it becomes those no longer are free, they become um, linked. And that's why it becomes more heat stable because you are creating covalent bonds. So it, instead of it being uh, denaturing at 84, it will denature at higher temperature. Okay.
<clears throat> Conalbumin is also known as ovotransferrin because of its ability to bind iron. And actually, this is a kind of a, a mechanism to be, to be an antimicrobial agent because it will bind iron, rendering it not available for microbes to grow. Um, And I did mention that binding iron make it more heat stable, or make, make it in general more stable, resist heat, pressure, denaturation, uh, hydrolysis by enzymes, and obviously denaturation, other denaturants. So like I said, it's, uh, none other uh, albumin protein has free sulfide group, but it does have high amount of disulfide linkages. So cysteines. That means these are double bond, or not double bond, covalently linked sulfidyl groups. You remember the difference between cysteine and cysteine? I'm trying to differentiate my pronunciation here. Cysteine is the free, the sulfidyl um, group is free, the amino acid where you have free sulfidyl group. Cysteine is when you have SS linkage between two cysteines. Ovomucoid is the highest in carbohydrate. It's a glycoprotein, and it's the highest in carbohydrate than any other albumin protein. So see, it's a, up to one-fourth of it is uh, carbohydrate. It's three unique domains, all linked by sulfidyl groups. And the, the polysaccharides are linked to aspergine um, residue. So it is very hydrophobic, like like, album, like the other proteins. Therefore, it's stabilized by uh, hydrophobic interactions. It has only eight cysteine compared to um, the conalbumin. Has 15. This has eight. And it does have a um, high, high percentage of beta sheet structure, which imparts its thermal stability. Beta sheet is more thermally stable than alpha helix. It has a biological function. It inhibits bovine trypsin, but not human trypsin, so we can eat it and not worry about protein digestion. So ovomucin is this is the largest uh, protein. So and it has the largest number of disulfide linkages. And oh, actually, it has more carbohydrate than the one before it. I lied when I said the other one had the highest. It's still early, isn't it? has a high percentage of sialic acid, which is this uh, sugar, acidic sugar, um, has two subunits, alpha and beta, and it, it contributes to the thick structure of the middle layer of the egg white, and that is, again, it's because of it has the highest molecular weight. And it does cross-link with lysozyme as well. So lysozyme, like I said, it's a glycoprotein. It's um, one of the globulins, G1. And it is basic. So if you remember, this is the one that had the high isoelectric point. So it is a basic protein. So it's post mostly positively charged under any food application. Um, it serves as an antibacterial agent. That's where its name comes from. It lyses what bacterial cell wall ruptures the bacterial cell wall. So, so it is very hydrophobic. It mostly, like any other globular protein, it's in the 
my interior moiety, but it does have a surface um, region that is hydrophobic. So the last two, they have, um, they contribute to the foaming properties. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then evidence is used in immunoassays. Does anybody know why? like to have a glimpse of why. And it binds like four of these molecules. So it enhances the sensitivity of the ELISA because it can bind at multiple sites with the secondary antibody. And then each of the uh, evidence will have uh, the enzyme that is linked to it that will you know, promote the color formation when you add the substrate. So because it binds to four, the biotins, then the interaction is m more, you have more sites of interaction with the antibody, and that's why you increase sensitivity. So that's why it's used for this function. It doesn't have that much other function in terms of the functionality of the egg white. So, like I said, egg white is the king of foaming. So you need to initiate denaturation, though, first, and that, is hap that happens by mechanical um, beating of, of the protein, which is a very common process, beating the egg whites, or whipping, they call it, not beating, right? Beating or whipping means very aggressive term, but yeah. <laughs> Whip it. Um, so yeah, so the protein denatures and start moving to the interface and then forming that film around the air uh, that is incorporated due to whipping. So proteins, like the globulins, would orient, of course, they're hydrophobic, we already know that, to the gas phase, and then the aqueous to the aqueous phase. So, and we all, we all know this principle, the proteins flex and form interactions and then form the film around the bubble. And that's what stabilizes the foam. So what I'm going to do now, since I have to go into the technicalities of this, and we only have three minutes, so I'm going to stop. We'll continue. We have a few more slides. We'll finish this next time and start protein modification. And next time we have a presentation. If you guys can be here 10 minutes to, to one, that would be great so that we get going. Not Waste time. Ten minutes to what did I say? Ignore that. Yes, ten minutes to two. 